All right. Hello, hello, folks. Welcome to the virtual tour of intentional communities. Great to have you with us. Here we are for the month of May 2023 for uh, this month's virtual tour where we sit down and learn from three different intentional communities, find out their story, ask them questions, and learn more about what's happening with the intentional communities movement uh, all around the United States and also globally for this one. My name is Cynthia, and I live at a community in Vermont, and I've been part of FIC, the organization that's hosting this event for many years, and I feel very fortunate now that I get to primarily work as a community matchmaker, helping people find communities to join that are a good fit for them. Okay, so if you're just joining, welcome again to the virtual tour of intentional communities. Today we have Hapori Eco Co-housing, E Street Attachment Community, and Fruitful Vegan Village joining us. And these are all forming communities. So these are communities in the early years of development, which I think is a wonderful opportunity for you all who are listening to you know, potentially join these communities and, and all of them are, are open to that, to more people joining. But also if you're someone who's thinking yourself about maybe starting or developing a community, you're really going to get an inside look into that process and what it takes to create a community and get something off the ground. We're going to start with Hapori Eco Co-housing. And we have here Pau and Michael joining us all the way from Mexico. Really, really happy to have you both here and looking forward to hearing the latest about your community because it's one I've been following here for a minute and I'm excited to learn more. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and hello to everyone. Yes, uh, we are saying hello to you all from San Miguel de Allende, Guanajuato, Mexico, which is right in the middle of Mexico. So if you picture uh, the country of Mexico, you will find us right in the middle. We are, I think, two hours uh, flight from, the direct flight from Houston. So it's uh, very easy to come and visit us. And this is my husband, Mike. Hello. And yes, so uh, we are Mike and Pau. And we are here to tell you about our community and why we have founded Hapori. Um, so we founded Hapori after doing a search around to see what other intentional communities were in the vicinity of where we're living. We chose this place because of the weather. Um, the climate here is amazing, we'll get to that. Um, and when we weren't finding uh, anything that was already happening uh, that was suitable, we made the leap to do it ourselves. So there was a couple of years of uh, research and planning and lots of reading um, and finding partners and finding land. And uh, we've made a lot of progress and we'll, we'll come to that shortly. Yes, uh, so, so far in our community, uh, it's us. And Kathy, what you can see in the left, and Anne and Scott. So we are three households. Um, Kathy is from Oregon, and Anne and Scott are originally from Utah, but they are living now in San Miguel de Allende. And our community, because we are an eco community within another larger um, eco community, and it's a very multicultural community. Of course, we have people from Mexico, we have people from uh, Spain, from France, obviously from the States, from Canada, from Germany. So um, San Miguel de Allende is a, a very multicultural city and we will get to it in a moment. And right now, the Hapori system, we just want to talk about what we do. Hapori is uh, an original Maori um, word. Maori is the native uh, language from New Zealand, where Mike is originally from, and it means where we met. and where we met. I lived there for eight years, 
and we have been in Mexico for five. And it literally means a section uh, of a tribe, a family, a society, a community. So a group of people with an intention. Um, really, our community is all about responsibility and support, living in harmony with the land and with the seasons. And we are stewards of this beautiful sacred land um, where we apply a values-driven process. We analyze, we have analyzed the specific site and the local climate to determine the uh, sustainable principle, uh, sustainable building defined principle. We are working um, with the members to teach and apply the principles of communal living with nonviolent communication and color collaborative decision making. And all of our buildings are designed and built in a sustainable way to really meet the specific needs and the desires of the community. So, so far, we um, acquired the land where we are in November 2021. We started building the first two houses in April 2022, so a year ago. And Mike and I, we moved um, into our new house in November, so six months ago. And our neighbor, Kathy, moved just um, three weeks ago. Um, we have a new house that is available right now um, for sale at the moment. It's called Casa Tierra Linda, so beautiful land house. And we also have three other houses under construction. So Kathy is building a, a tiny house next to her house. And we're building a large house for Anna and Scott. And we also have another large house for pre-sale. In terms of our um, goals for 2023, we are currently uh, promoting Casa Tierra Linda for sale. We are pre-selling the next large house and we already have it under construction with the system and the foundation uh, laid. And we are actively recruiting at least two, three new households before the end of the year. And we are in San Miguel de Allende, as I said, we are only 20 minutes drive for this, from this amazing city. Everyone says that it's a magical city. And it's a, a city that has been named by um, the Travel Cons, Con, Conde Nast um, magazine, the best city in the world, multiple times. So we are very, very lucky because we get to live sustainably amongst this beautiful land in nature and still enjoy all the wonders of an amazing city where there's like, concerts all the time and theater and like community. And it's just like really, really magic. The land is built literally on a rose quartz plate. So if you are into crystals, you will feel, feel like amazing energy here. And of course the weather is one of the most amazing things about here because Mike can explain a bit about the weather. Uh, so we've been at altitude here, although we're within the tropics, uh, you can see it's very comfortable throughout the year. Um, in the evenings, it cools down quite dramatically. So you get a lot of stability in the temperature with some, some good design. So we have very comfortable houses, not too hot, not cold at all in the winter. We get beautiful sun in the winter. Um, the weather's just amazing. Here. Yes. And... Um... So pretty much this is a, a layout of um, our community. And as you can see, everything is built around the common house here in the center. We have a beautiful fire pit, which you saw in the first photo, and a palapa, which is an outdoor space for um, coming together. And all the houses are around um, these common areas. We also have a guest house, um, that members will be able to use for their family and friends. And we have a community laundry. Um, this is another overview of the community. And the intention of our community is to regenerate the local ecosystem. So we have a regular planting events and uh, we do these like, not just like going up, planting, 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 but we are part of a, a international movement called Crystallized Roots Movement, which uh, the goal is to plant one million trees in the before the end of next year. 
And we have planted, I think so far, 150, but it was because we didn't have that, the rainy season. So once the rain comes in a, in a couple of weeks, we'll have more planting events. We also host uh, non-violent communication workshops and retreats. Um, we are very also into spiritual growth. Um, this is uh, an example of our houses. Um, they are super well insulated, steel or wood frame. Um, they are really uh, fast to be constructed and they all come with rainwater and uh, collection and water reuse system as long as, um, as well as solar panel um, that power the whole, the whole house. So these are the, this is the house that we have for sale at the moment, which is a two bedroom, one bathroom with a, um, a mezzanine on top. It also has a front porch and a palapa, which is like an outdoor terrace. These are photos from the house inside. So they are beautiful modern houses, but um, all eco-friendly. This, uh, this is an example of a large house, which is a house. And um, they are three bedrooms, two baths, and a mezzanine um, inside of the house. And in the wider community, we have the fire pits and the temascal, which is a, a traditional sweat lodge, which is part of the ceremonies that we do. We have uh, bio pools, which, as you can see, they look like, a, like an oasis. Um, and we also have a shala where we do like yoga and host um, different retreats and concerts and so on. And pretty much how to join Hapuri. Well, you get in touch with uh, us via yeah, message, all the different social media, uh, WhatsApp, um, whatever messages. We usually have a Zoom call first. We uh, ask you to come and visit the land so you can feel the land and meet all the people. Then we signed an agreement or a contract. We build your home to your specifications, and um, or you can work with an approved architect and designer. Bear in mind that everything that we are doing is like respecting the land, and you can move in in as little as five months. Or if you want to buy the house that we have available for sale, you can move in next week. Like it's already ready to go for you, and pretty much that's it. We made it on time. So if uh, anyone has some questions, we are more than happy to uh, answer them. Oh, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. I'm sold, sign me up. I wanna move Come on, <laughs> come on, meet you. Oh, oh, great, 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 great. Uh, yeah, we do have some questions coming in. Um, would you mind just stopping the screen share so we can yes. see you better? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So, um, well, Susan is asking about the demographics of the residents, but it's it sounds like it is it is mostly just you two right now. But you're in a very multicultural area, so you imagine the community would be pretty multicultural as well. Yes. So uh, it's multicultural, and so far it's us that we are in our 40s. We're expecting a baby, so we are also looking for families. We'll be the first family of the community, and there's another family here in the wider community. Uh, our, our, our other members are retired Americans. Um, so we want to be a multi-generational um, community. And, but one of our main, main focuses is like, having the shared experience between the older folk, folks with the new generations and pretty much bring up all these beautiful new kids into this new way of living so that's our vision ah ah great and congratulations on Thank all you. friends yeah oh, beautiful yeah. uh great um well, I see you're you're writing the answer to the question about the um, tools used to narrow down and find this ideal weather as well as the, dem the demographics. And I think that's along the lines as, of a few other questions people have asked, like, why did you choose uh, San Miguel? And, uh, you know, how, yeah, how did you come to be in your idyllic spot you have? 
you want to answer that? Um, so for San Miguel, we had a number of criteria for finding our ideal place to live. So we wanted to be uh, within a, a reasonable distance in Mexico City for Paula's family, who have since moved closer, uh, which is great. They're now um, just a, a one hour drive away. Um, we were looking at the, the weather and the climate. So um, we did, I did climate analysis. There's a great uh, website called Weather Spark. So you can type in different locations and get really good detailed summaries of how the weather is throughout the year, how hot, how cold, how much rain and all the rest, um, which is an amazing tool. And we uh, had some interesting experiences in New Zealand with natural disasters, um, especially earthquakes. So uh, a place without earthquakes, without volcanoes, without hurricanes, um, and San Miguel was very stable and very calm and relaxed. So, um, and also the multicultural aspect of the city, like um, San Miguel de Allende is known to be uh, an expat city. So there's people that have been living here for 50 years and they don't speak Spanish yet, which I find amazing. Um, but, you know, um, it's very easy to integrate and people, there's so many new people in town that everyone's open and uh, open to do, to, to have friendships and there's a lot of community sense. And um, so, yeah, in, in generally, if you ask people, why do you come to San Miguel? Everyone says like, it's a magical city. It just feels good to be here. Like there's very good energy. So that's also another of the reasons. Great, great. And uh, what what are the bio pools? Because I saw on your map that you're gonna have a, a lot of them, it looked like. What, what are they exactly? So we have one bio pool already in the wider community, which being a part of the wider community, we use the, the common areas of the wider community, which includes the Shala, the Temescal up there, uh, the bio pool that's already there. So a bio pool is a pool that uh, naturally filters the water with sand and gravel and with plants. So there's a pump in there that recirculates the water and then it undergoes that natural filtration. So it looks and feels like a natural pond um but it's it's man-made and the ponds will happen the lower area here there's over a million liters of uh water storage and you can swim in it the biggest pool will be a 25 meter long pool that you can swim laps in nice amazing mm -hmm. amazing so good uh, all right and then i think most of the other questions have to do with costs yeah. Um, you know, which I, I just put the um, the website address kapori.com.net and you can find all the information for pricing, details of the house. Um, but pretty much, um, just so everyone has an idea, the house that we have available at the moment is 165 US thousand US dollars, and it comes with the house and 1,000 square meters of land, and we have in total 1.7 hectares, which is like 4.5 acres. Mm -hmm. um, so you have an idea more or less, but we are, in, as I said, in a wider community of five times that. So mm -hmm. in total, there's like 20 acres and our community, our co-housing community has 4.5 uh, acres. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, and compared to the cost of housing right now in the United States, that seems really reasonable. That's, that's yeah. another reason why why we are uh, choosing San Miguel de Allende, especially if um, you are earning dollars. Um, coming and living here is super easy. We are growing some food, but we are not completely self-sustainable. But we are supporting the local growers. So we are, we have a, a fruit orchard, and we have some garden beds. Um, and we will have some uh, like chickens, and um, but we are not going to be completely sustainable, like self-sustainable. And with the water reuse systems, the residual water 
at the end of it all, it goes to the orchard. So the orchard is irrigated all year round with the residual water just from living here. So when Kathy moved in, we planted another four trees to use up the water that she's, um, she's generating. And as we have more people joining the community, we'll have more residual water. We'll need to plant more trees just to be able to use the water. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and then I see one last question, and then I want to wrap up with you um, around somebody who is themselves developing a community and has been running into uh, some financial issues, because it is, as you know, a big investment to buy the land, set things up. Um, you know, what legal structure do you use? Are, are you an LLC, do you own the land? How how does that work? Yeah, well, we created um, an investment um, entity and oh, uh, we funded the acquiring of the land with our funds and with Kathy's funds and with Anna Scott's investments. And that the land is owned by this legal entity and new members will be legal owners of their piece of land. So it will be resellable uh, if they decide to move on in the future, they can sell their piece of land or their, their share of the of the community. Gotcha. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Uh, Quick, another one last quick question. Any animals you plan to raise in the community, like chickens or yes, things? Like chickens, that? chickens for sure. And uh, we have talked about some other animals, but we are also waiting for more members to come in. So it's a communal um, decision because right now we don't have the capacity to, you yeah. know, run everything ourselves. So yeah. if people want to help with the chickens or the goats or whatever, we uh -huh. can discuss it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you so much. And I already see you're you're in the Q and A box answering those those other questions. So that's fantastic. And everyone, you you now have the website for their community, and you know you can reach out to ask more questions. And just yeah. It looks amazing. Congratulations. I know, I know it's a lot of work and, and hard work. So um, yeah, thank you for all that you're doing and just wishing you the best and that it may continue to flourish. Thank you. Thanks we hope to see everyone to, to come and actually feel this beautiful magical place. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Cool. All right. Good. And now we are going to travel away from Mexico and go to a different part of the world, back to the U.S., this time to Montana. And we have John with us to talk about a community that he is developing, E Street Attachment Community. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, John. Welcome. Thank you. I will uh, share my screen right now and start my presentation. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Um, so uh, after the lovely central Mexico climate, uh, this climate in Montana is a wee bit different. Not many people would say ideal, um, but it, it has its own special beauties. This was on the left, that's me um, at dawn on a jog um, in minus 20 degrees. But uh, having said that, minus 20 is a rarity, which was why I took the photo. Uh, normal winter temperatures are in the teens Fahrenheit um, and 20s. Um, regularly, it gets down to the single digits in Fahrenheit. And so several times a winter, not usually for very long, it gets below zero. Um, that was a particularly cold day. <laughs> um, so uh, I this community is, is hardly a community. It's just me at the moment. It's not even in its infancy. It's in utero right now. So this presentation is not going to be very long. Uh, but uh, for me, I think perhaps what's a useful question is why did I become interested in intentional community in the first place? And uh, the answer is I have a pretty specific story to that, which is that uh, in 2020, my kiddos both um, 
had moved out. I've got kiddos in their 20s uh, and are no longer here. I got a divorce and I bought a property, a separate property, new property. And I was sitting down with a buddy of mine one day in just a very casual conversation. I was telling him that I envision building a little tiny house uh, on my property and living very sustainably, uh, not an eco village, an eco house, a little tiny eco me. And he looked at me, um, because I've been in the Livingston community now, Livingston, Montana. I don't know if I said exactly where I am, Livingston, Montana, for 25 years now and been very invested in uh, the community in many ways. And he said, John, I really don't see you living alone. I see you doing something community related. And I mean, his words really hit home and hard. And I went home after that conversation and stumbled across the Foundation for Intentional Community and have been gobbling up podcasts and webinars and books uh, ever since then. So uh, it's an exciting new development for me in a new phase of my life. Uh, so that's the why of it a little bit. So now, and the property that I bought, the house that I'm sitting in that house slash shed, it's, it says Montana Shed Center on the outside. So I guess I live in a shed, not a house, but it's my home at any rate, um, is temporary. Um, and uh, I do envision building, um, you know, developing an eco village with tiny homes or even a, a tiny lodge, I'm calling it. I would, I would hope for the first building to be a lodge that uh, multiple people could live in um, in community. Uh, but hopefully... Um, eight lodgings in all. And I don't know whether that means uh, 16 people, 20 people, not sure what that means. Um, very much in its infancy. Uh, so I'm painfully aware, I've made your concerns about trying to develop or plan a community as one person. So that's a, a concept I'm grappling with a lot these days. And I've plugged in to different resources and webinars and gotten some good advice. So I'm leaning into that. Um, but I guess I can go ahead and change the screen. I'm tired of looking at my face at any rate. So let's see if I can make it move. There we go. Uh, this is the property from that um, shed on the uh, right hand side is uh, that's me. I'm sitting in that place right now. This is a couple months ago. Uh, you can see a couple of my um, fellow communitarian standing on the little ridge line right above the house, that being the deer that I'm talking about. There's more uh, rabbits and deer around here than uh, I know what to do with. They've gobbled up all the gardens uh, I have attempted. So uh, more work to be done on that um, front. But uh, what I envision is a community uh, that focuses on minimal consumption, minimal waste, uh, maximum vegetables, and uh, it's a it's an acre and a half ish of land, so it's not very big, but it is right um, on the edge of town. So there are um, we have city services. Uh, I, I mean, I intend to install solar, so have minimal need for city services. But we are, you know, um, we've got city water and city sewer and trash collection. Um, right on this slope. Livingston is mostly flattish, but it's right at the this hill um, uh, that I now in a little tiny piece of is a, a south facing slope. So we're looking up at the bottom of the property up the hill. And uh, if I advance one more, this is from the top of the property looking down. So you can see Livingston, the town of Livingston, and then the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness, uh, or the first mountains in the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness in the background there. It's not quite visible, but sort of the entrance. This is on um, Interstate 90, and uh, Bozeman, Montana would be the nearest big city, big is relative. I know there are a million people in Montana. Uh, so uh, there are 8,000 people in Livingston. So, um, Bozeman has an airport. I'll put it like that. Uh, and it's also worth noting that what you can't see, we're just right off the right side of this picture is there's a, a gap in the valley and that is the entrance to Paradise Valley and Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone National Park is an hour south from us. So that's a pretty special, magical place. And um, 
winter is long and cold and sometimes unpleasant, uh, but uh, not spring so much. Spring's muddy, uh, but uh, summer and fall are pretty glorious. Uh, people do travel uh, the world to come here in those months at any rate, <laughs> and there's good skiing. There's, there's lots of good reasons to come to Montana, but you have to be uh, ready to tolerate the cold for sure. Uh, and then the last slide I have, I would assume that some people might be saying, why, uh, why attachment community? Why do you um, specifically use that word? And that has to do with the job that I've been in for the last six years. I work in a community health center. Um, so um, from a U.S. perspective, community health centers are all over the country, and they provide health services to all without regard to for their ability to pay. So people come in and pay on a sliding scale um, for um, excellent service. And we offer mental health and um, dental health and medical, physical health. But I oversee a sort of novel department that uh, focuses on parent support and career support. Uh, and it sits inside a community health center because we know that... Um, parent support, uh, supports given to families with young children have better lifelong health outcomes than just popping in to see a doctor for a visit or to get your teeth fixed, right? Uh, so it's been a neat experience for me. And the core of the parent support programming at any rate is all about developing attachment. Attachment is diagnosable. It's not just a vague word. Being securely attached in relationship um, provides uh, wonderful benefits. I've taken the little pic that you see on your screen now. That's part of a flyer that I put out when we uh, offer parenting workshops on a regular basis. And I have just become so um, fascinated by uh, attachment and its importance in everyone's lives, not just parents and young children, but um, spouses, partners, friends, that uh, it seemed important enough to me to include it in the name of my my community. I can't, that, that doesn't work. Um, you get what I'm trying to say here, this future community in utero right now. And it seems to me, as I sit here in ignorance about living in community, that focusing on secure attachments between and betwixt the members of the community is a great way to develop the kinds of relationships that you need for a community to be successful. So there I am in all my naivete, spouting off on stuff that I don't know anything about, and I am ready for questions. Oh, thank you so much, John. Thank you for being brave and deciding to present and share, <laughs> even though it's in progress, just a lot of appreciation for you. Aww. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I'll have you, if you're able to stop the screen share, and it's really I good to, to know why you are working with E Street Attachment Community is the name. Mm -hmm. I had, when I heard it the first time, I thought, oh, maybe there's like an attachment to a building or something but this is way deeper nope. so yeah secure attachment it's a it's a it's a thing it's rich it's been known about for um, decades and um and yet not enough people know about it and i i think in my brain uh living in intentional community and knowledge of attachment just seems fundamentally related uh, yeah yeah great and how long ago did you start this journey? Like, when did you decide that you wanted to? 2020. So pretty new, bought a subset of the property that I own now in 2020. And the property above it became available uh, just last year. So I just bought the, I mean, I had like half an acre. Now I have an acre and a half um, just last fall. So it, it now opens up to me, the possibility of creating community with some other brave um, souls in the near future. Great, great. Yeah, and, and one of the questions we had was, um, how far is the nearest store? But it, it looked like from your photo, it's the town is right there. I walk to work. It's a half mile to downtown. My office is, um, I mean, it's only an 8,000 person town, but um, 
we have restaurants and stores. Uh, it's a very, it's an artsy community. I wouldn't, I've been to San Miguel de Allende and I, it's not as artsy maybe as San Miguel, but uh, it's a, it's a neat special place. It's anyone who has been to lived in Livingston would tell me I was lying if I didn't mention the wind. It is a windy place here too, which is sometimes unpleasant. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It was incredible because when you showed the first photo, I was like, "Okay, this is in the middle of nowhere." But then yeah. you turned around, and there's the town. But then you see in the distance the wilderness and yeah. Yellowstone. So yeah, cool. you can't really see between in that photo between my property is the town first, then the Yellowstone River flows right through town, uh, and then the interstate. And then the mountains and the wilderness. Um, so that's all in a tight area. But yeah, uh, we're on an interstate, uh, 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 international, well, not international, an airport. Uh, um, a good airport is 30 minutes away. Okay. 40 okay. Minutes. All right. And then we have some questions about your vision for the community at this stage. How many people do you hope to have and what type of housing do you imagine? I think you had you had mentioned um, tiny houses. Tiny homes, natural building. I, I've been, for those who follow Quail Springs at all, I've been watching some of their content. They are a uh, intentional community in the Southwest, Nevada maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, they have some natural building courses. So um, I envision the tiny homes to be built into the slope and um, have on their north side dirt and then glass and solar panels to grab the sun to do passive solar heat as well as um, electrical. Well, not electrical heat. I shouldn't say that. I'm sitting on a rocket mass heater. I don't know if anyone's familiar with rocket mass heaters, but they are a hyper efficient, um, albeit not legal in most places, um, way to heat your home uh, that I'm taking advantage of. Nice. How many people? Oh, um, 10 to 20. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. With the possibility of adjacent property, undeveloped adjacent property being purchased uh, um, and expanding. Great. Great, great, great. Let me see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah. Is there a need for these buildings to be off grid? There is not. No, I'm on the power lines run right over this house uh, and I'm wired into the city. I would uh, ideally uh, we'll have solar panels that um, make us net zero, um, but we'll have electricity um, mm -hmm. from the grid as well as off grid. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so then we're getting a question, which I think you even touched on in your presentation about the way that your community is developing. And um, yeah, I, I had a consulting session with somebody in a similar position to you where they have property and they want community. Yeah. And I just want to, I want to lay out for everyone. So in, in my view, there's two ways that communities typically form. Either it's a situation where there's someone like you who, you know, you have the land, you're set up, you don't want to move, you want to invite people in. So you're looking for your people. Mm -hmm. And then, and then there's the other path where there's a group already, um, could be a couple, could be three people, four or five, however many, and they're working it together. They're developing the vision, the culture, and then they do a property search to find that land. Uh, yep. There's pros and cons to both. A lot, a lot of communities start out, my community included, where I am in Vermont, started out with just a founder and then transitioned into a group situation and group ownership. And it is the journey, not always easy, um, but there's pros and cons. So what what have you learned and what, what are you thinking about around all this? Well, I haven't learned enough for sure. Um, and I um, am in one of the uh, groups on the forum that's for founders that um, Sky Blue uh, and another are the hosts of or the facilitators, moder moderators of. And he broke my heart a little bit uh, a couple months ago and said that the, uh, uh, the history of intentional communities are littered with um, single male founders who have grandiose ideas and who crash and burn. And uh, 
oh, that strikes pretty close to home. Um, so as I am developing this, I'm going to try to be very deliberate about um, avoiding um, whatever pitfalls I might. Uh, I own all the property right now. What's top of mind for me is how to get out of that position. That's not an equal power sharing position. So to put the land in uh, some sort of trust um, so that all can own it and I can just be an equal participant in it is tops on my list. How to go about that? I haven't got that figured out yet. I think Cynthia was in one of the um, speakers in your recent event that was a lawyer that gave us the opportunity to schedule 30 minute consults with him. Do you know who I'm talking about? Clifford Pollen. Yes. I met with him the other day and he had lots of good advice and now I will be um, investing some of my dollars in uh, his work to help me get that process right for just becoming an equal owner participant. I don't exactly know how yet. Uh, and I also noticed that a couple of the other comments were about, do I have other partners in this endeavor? No, uh, I want to get clear in my mind how to... Um, divest myself of this property before I bring in people. There are people I, that I could ask that I think would be interested, but I don't, I, I don't like where I'm sitting in, the, in that conversation right now. So I want to get a few things straight before I invite people in um, because um, like I've already said, I just want to, it to be an equal um, participatory endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you're going about this in a very conscious way. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Melanie uh, put in the chat, it's funny. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, so you said, okay, single males, you know, littered in the history of intentional communities. She says, but the single males don't usually bring in attachment theory. <laughs> so you're already well, that's kind of you to notice at any rate. <laughs> yeah. oh, great. Okay. There's more you may want to check out in the chat afterwards. Okay. We'll but, do. Yeah. Thank Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate Thank you. it. Yeah. And you have a listing in the communities directory so people sure can do through that. Great. Yep. Right. All right. And now we get to go to Patricia. Hello, Patricia with Fruitful Vegan Village. So another forming community. And I'm really, uh, yeah, excited to learn more about what you're creating. Thank you so much. And thank you, Cynthia, for hosting this. It's just such a great idea. In my 48 years of seeking community and wanting to build community, I see such a need for you. So you're, you're fulfilling a really valuable role. And I wish you the best in your new endeavors. Thank you. So I think that you're welcome. And I, I think I do want to start out with the slides. I am just going, um, I think I'll give, I'm just going to give a really quick overview with the slides. And then can, uh, I will say this is the first time I've ever done any kind of slideshow. Technical stuff is not my, um, always my strength, but um, I want to, uh, I, I tried. And then I am going to actually read from a script because this is saying the 10 minutes. Whoa, that's challenging. So this lovely group of people, they are people who are my advisors in community. And Amrit Naus, who's right next to me um, in with a scarf, I've known her for 28 years. And she is um, my main supporter. And these other people I've met recently, but I will share with you more about this, but they, the role that they are playing in encouraging me to create community. And so the next one. And so this is a common house and over to the left, it shows it's not finished inside, but it's a very sturdy structure. I was very fortunate to have someone uh, pay for the building of the common house, but couldn't quite finish it. But a common house, I believe, is essential for community building. And even though there are no other places to live at this time, it will be a place where up to about 25 people can gather. Next. So this is a yom, which is a combination of a yurt and a dome. And this is in a quiet area of the community where 
Um, in community, people sometimes need a time to get away from all the activities. So this is a place, it needs work. It's pretty old, but it's on a sturdy deck and a place just so people can be quiet in their spirit, whatever spiritual path that they are following, or it's a journal or things like that. Next. And this is the forest that is in the Ozarks. This is the Arkansas Ozarks, where the property is located. That um, the Ozarks are a beautiful place with four seasons and not too, the weather isn't too extreme. So the property has mostly forest and um, is, but can be easily developed into clusters of housing. And you can go ahead. This is an old trailer that has stood the test of time. Now, as you can see that all that clutter out there, I decided to show that, you know, I don't want to hide the, the shaky parts of the community. There's still stuff to clean up. I collect this stuff because a lot of it is, is going to be good for something. And some of the, in the back of the trailer, there's a lot of soil amendments and things that I've collected from another place I lived. Uh, I don't live there right now, but the, this, um, uh, yes, there are chiggers and ticks. Oh, that's a question. Anyway, that is another downfall. But the trailer I see as a place where we can people can do healing modalities and uh, peer counseling, places where people need private interactions and quiet also. Next. Hmm. Is there anything next? Uh, there, sorry. It was just, uh, it was a glitch. Oh, no problem. And that's the garden, which uh, I have lived on the property for on and off uh, for 20 years. And again, not living there now, but it is a place, this garden, I hope to be at all kinds of great permaculture principles. I mean, you know, not add the pr principles, but all kinds of great organic matter to make it even better. So next. And this is a lake that is about 10 minutes from the property. It's part of a larger neighborhood of 700 acres where a, a Christian community, I mean, a Christian couple wanted to uh, start a, a Christian community and they sold plots, uh, lots of land to people. Uh, I am a Christian universalist, which means that I do not believe in eternal conscious torture. I would like um, just so therefore I can welcome all spiritual paths on, uh, you know, into the community and and we can find ways of, of encouraging each other on a spiritual path. So I'm going to leave it at that beautiful picture. And I did not start my time. I wanted to kind of keep track of it myself. How much more longer do I have? It's a great question. Um, let's say five minutes. Okay. Well, I wanted to give you the history of when I started dreaming about community. It was about five decades ago when I was 19. And I embarked alone with only a backpack traveling overland from Germany to Sri Lanka. And this 13 month journey in the 1970s that included India, Pakistan, Iran, and Afghanistan would change the course of my life forever. And here's the book I, 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 um, I wrote, and that's me in the middle. Oops, can't quite do that. I wanted to make a slide, but that's the only picture I took on the journey because I wanted to be so present. I mean, actually somebody took that picture. So uh, before I left on this uh, journey, I was going to a college to get a degree and then heading down a very destructive path with the philosophy, if it feels good, do it. But encountering all the beautiful culture that I stayed with a lot of the local people. I didn't want to go to the tourist attractions. And uh, I witnessed the beauty of family and community connections. And on the way back from this very harrowing trip and full of wonderful things too, on the plane, I had a revelation. The only way I would be happy was if I would serve and then use the skills that I enjoyed using. So then a series of events 
led me to coming back to uh, San Diego, California, meeting my former husband, Cliff, who is still a neighbor and good friend and father of our son, Chris, and he is also a vegan. And he introduced me to many values like natural foods, permaculture, although they didn't call it permaculture then, wild edibles, conspiracy facts, AKA conspiracy theories, living in harmony with the earth, including cold therapy and grounding, and the importance of having alternatives to the regular currency, which now includes uh, the cooperative systems like Time Banks USA. So I had already become a vegetarian before I traveled. And I became a vegan eight years ago when I realized that animals suffer even more in the egg and dairy industry. And therefore, um, when I had the opportunity to own this land, which is a long story how I came about acquiring this, uh, it's 18 acres. Uh, and, um, and then, I, I I saw a question and I got distracted. Anyway, so I um, when I, I became a vegan, I realized I wanted to become, oh, I forgot to tell you. When I came to Arkansas, when we were invited, Cliff and I, to trade us our, our services of uh, grunt labor to help start the first organic uh, blueberry farm in Arkansas, well, somebody shared with us the community, Intentional Communities Magazine. And that's where I learned about communities, Intentional Communities. I immediately knew that was my destiny. So that was 48 years ago. And ever since then, I have been try. I have been wanting to either start one or join one, or I've been, I've visited many, I've lived in some, I've always been living in some kind of cooperate, cooperative situation and never gave up my dream. So when I had the opportunity to um, own 18 acres, which was something I never thought I could do because I live very simply and uh, just it was just a miracle. I also had the miracle of having somebody who supported my vision to, to um, build the community building, which was really great. So over the only the past six weeks, I have become reinvigorated because that those people that you, uh, I introduced in the beginning, they I met them in Eureka Springs, which is an hour away. We are way out in the boonies and off the grid and um, and uh, people. Yes, I, I'm sure people want to know how to live. Let me see on my time. And so. I, they have shown me that, inspired me that the purpose of this community is to live according to values that I believe are ones that everybody in the world, if they followed, would make a better world. And so then also to acquire, to practice, teach, and learn, all, I mean, practice, learn, and teach all the community skills that we need in order to have healthy community. And uh, they, are my, they are helping me do that right here in Eureka Springs, we are creating community. And we use something called Community Connect, and that is a name that Cynthia and I both discovered. So I, with that, I welcome questions. Great, and no more slides. We're finished with the slideshow? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll stop. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. Really. Yeah. Really appreciate your sharing about not only the community that you're developing now, but also your long journey with visiting, living in, exploring, trying to start community. Yeah. Really appreciate your sharing all that. Mm. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Great. Um, let me just go over and see if there are other questions. Um, one question I had for you, just to clarify the location of the community, because I, I was, you're in the Ozarks, but yeah, what's the closest town? What's the, what, tell us more about the land. Uh, well, the closest little tiny town is 10 minutes away, which has a post office and gas station. The next 
town is a uh, larger town is Huntsville, which is 20 minutes away and has um, just about everything that you need in order to live. And then our way, we have Eureka Springs, which is a very artsy town. That's where I'm, I'm living right now, temporarily. And then uh, it sounds like similar to Livingston. And then Fayetteville is a college town uh, our way. So we're not totally out in the boonies. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're you're living in town, but then you go to the property to do projects and... Yeah. Right. And I'm hoping I'm uh, to move there in July because I am ready to just dive in. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I, I, yeah. And I have a way of welcoming people and screening people that is on, I forgot to say, it is on the fruitfulveganvillage.com blog. Okay, great. Yeah. So fruitfulveganvillage.com is the website where people can learn more. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Great. And so interesting that you decided to start with building a common house. I think that's, you know, sometimes communities like that's the last thing that they get to. I know that's been true here in our community and increasingly we're feeling, feeling the lack of having a common house. So yeah. What made you decide to start with that? Well, that is what I had heard through my whole 48 years of study that a common house is really important because then at least people can live in tents or they don't they don't all need a kitchen and a living room and they can let so um you know they can live in smaller dwellings or campers but and then they have a place to gather gathering for meals for uh events and and having a place that's not owned by someone, which means that you have to always ask that person and they often get burned out because their place is used so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I just really felt strongly that this was important. And people can also, the first people who come, they can, we can sleep in there too. I know it's not, a common house is not made for that, but I wanna have all these little cubbies where people can keep their stuff there and, um, and they can, we can put down cots and, you know, it live ex extremely simply. Nice. Mm. And how about the name? Someone is asking why uh, fruitful in your name. Why fruitful? Well, fruitful um, has a number of meanings, which I always like, you know, in the permaculture uh, principles, th things have always more than one purpose. So fruitful is I love fruit and I would live in the tropics and eat fruit all the time, but I ended up here in the Ozarks. So we do have a lot of fruit growing that we can grow. I do want to grow much fruit. So fruitful, of course, is a vegan thing. And then also fruitful, we want to be, it reminds me of having fruits of the spirit so that we can encourage each other to develop those character qualities that are like uh, peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, and those things. And then it also just fruitful in that we want to reach out to the larger uh, world, to, the, to our neighborhood, uh, we have a farmer's market and other activity. You know, Huntsville is really for a small town of 2000, let's see, I think it's 20,000 people. Uh, it, it really has a lot going on, a lot of cooperation. And then there's the, the I just see that there is a, a, such a need for people to learn community building skills. And that is something I really want to share with all of life and be fruitful. Mm -hmm. mm, beautiful. Ah, oh, Patricia, thank you so much again for sharing. Really appreciate it. Mm. You're welcome. Thank you for having me so much. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right, folks. So we're shifting now into the uh, final portion of our time together where we get to ask questions to all of our panelists. So for those of you who are listening, if you have like a good question you want to ask that might be relevant for all of our panelists, uh, feel free to put that in the Q&A box. And yeah, to kick things off, I, I have noticed in all of your presentations how, how there is an element in your 
journey to start a community where you're really relying on the support of other people who've gone before and done these projects. Mm -hmm. You know, with Harpori, yes. you, you said right from the beginning, we spent time visiting other projects in Mexico to learn from them. And then you too, John, you know, you got you got advice from your your friend or reflection from a friend about starting a community. And then you've you have right from home taken upon yourself to go on the forum, to to read books, to connect, to listen to podcasts. Amazing. And then Patricia, now you have your whole advisor circle, which is a great idea for anyone starting a community. You know, what an honor to ask somebody, hey, will you be an advisor on my project? Like most people would would say yes, if they have the time. And then you get some support immediately on your journey. Um, so anyways, that said, can you can you speak to that a little bit more about the role that outside support has had on your journey and specifically for those people in the audience who are listening and they themselves are looking for support and inspiration? What advice might you give to them? So we'll just go popcorn, anything you want to say related to all that. I don't think I've done enough of that yet, Cynthia. Uh, I had signed up to go visit Dancing Rabbit um, uh, in 2020. And of course, the pandemic came along. And so in-person uh, visits ceased. Uh, and then prior to Dancing Rabbit, a fellow that you had on your um, community event a month or so ago, Paul Wheaton, uh, you remember Paul Wheaton? Uh, I have gone out to his property in Western Montana, um, but that was to learn how to build a rocket mass heater. Uh, like I'm, I'm sitting on one right now. That's why I do that motion. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't, I, I'm not quite sure. And he spoke to it a little bit in his presentation about whether he it's an intentional community or not, or it's uh, the Duke of per Permaculture and his vassals. Um, but it's an interesting place to go visit. And they've got a lot of interesting things going on. So um, I'll shut up because I, I just wanted to say while I've attempted to get some into, you know, direct face to face uh, support, I have more work to do there. I need to go visit and then stay in some communities mm -hmm. and I haven't done it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And that's the next step for you is to make some visits. Yeah. Great. Yeah. For us here in Hapori, um, before the pandemic, we went around and we visited uh, some of the existing communities and eco villages and things like that in the area to look at what they were doing um, and whether we wanted to, to join those. And one of the things we found was there wasn't really anyone doing like proper co housing. Um, and that's what we were looking for. That's what we wanted was true community and that level of involvement. And so from there, it was lots of research, lots of reading. There's some amazing books, um, creating co-housing. Um, what's the other one? Creating a life together um, is was amazing for the, the more philosophical aspects. Um, we did some workshops where we invited people we knew and reached out in social media or locally for people who are interested in that sort of thing to do some brainstorming to come up with ideas um my my notepad here is actually one of the uh the design elements in this case for things we wanted to um to have in the community our vision and values and so we took a very collaborative approach to developing the values, um, to then define the vision, to then use that as the basis. And we have a great resource for the community. Her name's Kat. She lived in uh, intentional communities and co-housing communities for many, many years in the US. And she's now living in town here. Um, so she's quite involved with us as well. And um, once she's ready to move out of the inner city, it's quite popular to move here to San Miguel, live in the inner city, enjoy all the culture and stuff. And then after a couple of years go, okay, now I'm ready to move out to the countryside and have a bit more peace, but still be able to reach out to the, um, to the city that we have nearby. So the nearby city is about 150,000 people. So it's a good size. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is that I am committed, oops, I am committed to putting the land into a community land trust, which I also, I studied that. I mean, I, I have this big fat book that came out a number of years when, when we didn't have the internet, still have it. And yet now there are, there's this one website, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Cynthia, but I was able to download about 30 pages of fill in the blanks of how to um, a legal document, a template. And that, uh, I think that, that, and it, that website also, they have consultants for community land trust to, to how to develop it. So you, cause I've tried to find a lawyer for many years. And I, I think going to a consultant who can help you build a community land trust is very helpful. And um, cause it is important to me to get the land out of my name as soon as possible. And this group of advisors could turn into the board of directors because a land trust does need to have a board of directors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. Um, do you have a link for that website handy? You can I put don't, and I don't, I just do, it just escapes me. I'm sorry. Yeah. No but if you do, if you do a search on community land trust there, I think you'll find it. How to, how to build a, a template. Uh, usually the, those, the names of these, there's a couple of organizations that are really active and offer all kinds of free resources. It's amazing how, how helpful they are. Nice. Nice. Great. Oh, good. Okay. Um, oh, and then John, are you able to put your contact information uh, into the chat? Some people are asking about that to connect with you. Uh, yeah, I just um, responded to that Q with an A, but I don't know if everybody will see that. So I'll put it in the um, in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah, the chat would be great. Okay. You got it. Um, yes, and there will be a recording of this event available. So everyone who's a Zoom participant, you will get an email that'll have a link to the recording. And we'll also be putting it on uh, YouTube so everyone can watch. And we're we're live streaming on Facebook too. So you can you can find the recording on Facebook as well. All right. Um, so I see there's a lot of Wonderful activity happening in the chat and some questions. Um, just going to see what makes sense to go to next with our remaining time. Um, yeah. Okay. I think this is a good one that Cyrus, Cyrus is asking in the Q&A box. Um, yeah. So just... They're acknowledging, you know, we all seem like we have great energy and would want to be wonderful people to share co-living space with. However, what filters, if anyone, if any, does anybody have in place to prevent negative vibes from coming into a community? Um, you know, I could imagine a happy, peaceful community of dozens of people being brought down if a violent person were to get involved. Um, so yeah, this is touching on the membership process, right? So we'd love to hear what you have seen working well, what you're envisioning for your membership processes. Go ahead, Patricia. Well, I have seen this over and over again, how, and, and, and heard from other communities, how just one person can, and they don't have to be violent. They can just be really able to go against uh, everything that people are trying to do and it, it drags people down. It, it's very destructive. And so uh, when I, I have a pretty um, clear, it's, it's a hard screening process. I'm no longer eager just to, oh, you know, let everybody in no matter how nice they are, because I have seen so many people who seem really nice and they end up uh, being destructive. So I, um, one of the things that's different is uh, we do 
I mean, there's, it's like, first there's a, I want people to look at the values and, and then make sure that they're serious. And then after that, a questionnaire about, a written questionnaire about the values, and then an interview. And then, and, and I actually based my energy interview, I looked up how do employers uh, interview people and ask questions that really draw things out of the people that, um, that they maybe are trying to hide. So I'm not trying to, you know, anyway. And, and so if they pass the interview, then they can be invited to uh, for a visitor period of three weeks. And then if that all goes well, then they need to commit to, to learning, the co regularly learning the community skills. So if even if I'm the only one there and people come, I can teach nonviolent communication. And then Amrit, my dear friend, um, teaches what she calls peer support skills. This is really unique because what she teaches is how to do emotional release so that when issues come up in the in the community, we can release, we can get the charge off of them. A lot of time it comes from the past, past triggers. And then when we use nonviolent communication, there will be a much more heartfelt connection. So the commitment to doing other practices of, of community building skills, I think will be, will show if people really aren't sincere, they're not gonna wanna be there because they know that they're, they're going to need to um, really do that inner work to in order to uh, truly live in healthy community. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Same. Like, uh, like what Patricia just said, like when we meet someone, we usually tell them that part of one of the most important parts of being uh, a member in the community is to commit to the regular nonviolent communication workshop. And, and that's actually one of the biggest filters for yeah. people who aren't aligned. Yeah. Because as soon as you say, um, come and join us and we're going to work on communication skills together, yeah. there's some people and just straight away you see the shutters come down and they're like, mm. Mm, actually no. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the greatest filters is actually just saying, yeah, we we do mandatory communication training, mm -hmm. and it's it's one of the biggest filters. And we talk about like being open hearted, and that it's not like an obligation, but a lot of the members here have a spiritual practice, and that we come together to do these like spiritual growth retreats. And if people are fighting with that, they they feel attracted. It's not it's be their thing. But it's also not mandatory. Exactly. Because so I'm quite non-spiritual. I'm a hands-on practical kind of guy. So I support that and like I look after the fires and all of that sort of thing. But it's it's not a mandatory part of it. It's about finding where we overlap and working together as community. Mm -hmm. John, any thoughts on this you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, my thoughts are that I don't have any business answering this question because uh, I've never lived in community. Uh, I can parrot things that I've heard, like I'm hearing Laird Schaub's voice in my head right now. Um, so your practices and your processes, the success of the community lives or dies by those. Um, so yeah, you do your best to get it right and conflict is inevitable. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Um, so we do have some other questions coming in, um, and we have just a short amount of time. Um, and so, you know, if any of you feel, feel free to type in the chat, if you want to respond to things and, um, just with, um, Faye's question regarding, um, uh, handling uh, COVID um, among community members. I just want to let you know, a lot of these communities are very in the new, new forming stages, don't have a lot of members. So I don't imagine this was um, something that they uh, have a lot to share about, uh, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. And then um, let's dive into 
the financing question because it would be good to just clarify um, because I get this question a lot. Can you get a mortgage on a home in a community? Is that possible if it isn't a land trust or an LLC? And my understanding is that in most all communities I've been to, the answer is yes, you can get bank financing um, for a home in a community. But Anything more you you all want to add to that, and especially Hapori, because you you have some homes available for sale. So we we are at the process with the um, the subdivision and the land and that sort of thing. It, it is a long drawn out process here. Um, so at the moment, um, it's not possible to get a mortgage on a property. But in the future, it will be. So once the subdivision is all confirmed and we have the individual titles and all of that, um, it's quite common here where when you buy a property in a, a neighbourhood that your title may not be ready for a couple of years. That's, that's very common here. Um, but we're working through the process at the moment for the subdivision process and the creation of the titles, the creation of the condominium that owns the common areas for our community. And so each property within our community will have a share of the condominium that owns the communal areas. Um, so once all of that is finished, then yes, you'll be able to go to the bank and get a mortgage on the property if because you're it's all right. if you're a resident. So to buy land here, you you really do need to be resident. Um, Temporary or pem permanent. Yeah. So you need to apply at immigration for a residency status, which is easy. <laughs> it's paperwork, but um, there are some steps that you need to, to follow and do with yeah. the government. In, in the last couple of years, there's also been a big crackdown on actually enforcing immigration law here. Uh, so the traditional perpetual tourist avenue that some people exploit is no longer viable. So if you want to live in Mexico, uh, you actually do need to become a resident. Mm, okay, okay, thank you. That was going to be one of my questions about how you how you actually move as a foreigner to Mexico. So yeah. sounds like it's it is still easy, but not as easy as it was in the past, maybe. Uh, it's fairly easy. And to give you an idea, uh, monthly income for residency requirements is uh, about 3,300 US dollars to get residency. Um, okay. Or savings of at least uh, 220,000 US dollars, um, which is also how much one of our large houses costs. So. If you can afford to buy a house here in Mexico, you can afford to get residency. You can show that you have this. Gotcha, gotcha. Hi. And a lot of people live with their pension uh, pension payments. Because mm -hmm. like, even though San Miguel is on the higher uh, end of cost of living, compared to the cost of living in the US is way cheaper. Mm -hmm. So you can have like a, an amazing luxury lifestyle on your normal U.S. budget. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. And then uh, one more question. I'm imagining the answer is yes, that you can have dual citizenship and or residency in both the... Oh, yeah, the when you apply for residency, you don't lose your uh, citizenship. You will be forever your, whatever your citizenship is. And so you are also legally uh, entitled to live in Mexico. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, and you already, awesome. Good. Okay. Thank you for, for uh, sharing those logistics. I can imagine there's many people in the U.S. who are saying, oh, Mexico sounds very attractive right now. So yeah. In the weather is phenomenal. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I have to say, as someone, I live in the northern Vermont climate, and I like my winter, so don't want to discount Montana or the Ozarks, you know, to each their own. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to our audience. Thank you for your listening and your questions. Really fantastic questions. And uh, we'll be doing this same event 
next month. It's always on the first Thursday of the month at the same time. And we'll have three new communities uh, to share with you for our June event. And you can uh, find out more about that on the events page at ic.org. So ic.org slash events. Uh, yeah. And to our presenters, Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for the work you're doing to build your communities. We need more communities on this planet, strong, residential, ecological, sustainable communities. Um, so thank you for your work to make that happen. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Thank you got you. It. And good luck. <laughs> thank you so much. Mm. Thank right. you for the opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're a great and encouraging hostess. Oh, good. I try to bring out the best in us. Good. good, good. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.